If you ask a creative anti-realist a question like, were there dinosaurs before humans? They'll say, of course, everybody knows that. But if you put that temporal operator out front and say, before humans, was it true that there were dinosaurs? Then they'll say no. Einstein, Albert Einstein, was responsible for some major conceptual shifts in history of physics. And a lot of his major contributions to physics were th just pure thought experiments. So, you know, the, the Nazis had their morality, we have our morality, and that's the end of the story. So I don't think that is the end of the story. I think the end of the story is that the Nazis were wrong. Do you like the show? Do you want more armpits? Well, be sure to follow me on YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, TikTok. Be in my walls for all I care. If you want to support and help grow the stream, like this video, subscribe, click the notification button, and leave a comment down below. All those things boost me in the algo, and they're free for you. Think about it. Awesome. Well, maybe we'll start by you just introducing yourself to, I guess, me and, and the chat, because I know you've been mostly speaking with my manager, so um, I'd love to get to know you from your own perspective okay are we streaming now is we're live time? yeah <laughs> have we been live this whole time we have been live this whole time but that's okay there's not many there's just trickling in right now all right um so you said introduce myself um my name is thomas bogartis i'm a associate professor of philosophy at pepperdine university in malibu california um i'm originally from california um Back in college, I majored in biology, thinking I was going to go to medical school, um, very much intending to go to medical school or get a PhD and become a research scientist. Um, but then I guess I discovered that philosophy existed. Nobody really told me that until college. And yeah. I realized that's what I was most interested in. That's that's what I was talking with my friends about like late into the night. Um, so I decided to give it a try. Um, I went to a master's program in philosophy not really intending to try to make a career of it or anything, just intending to get it out of my system and then go do the responsible thing and go to medical school. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing led to another, and I guess 20 years later, yeah, here I am. So Crazy. Okay, so are you teaching as well, it sounds like? You're teaching and doing the whole gambit? I am, I am teaching, yeah. I'm guessing, is that the only way you can really have a career in philosophy is if you're teaching or writing, basically? To like make money yeah i mean there are some alternative there are some careers that are alternative to um being an academic if you even if you get a phd in philosophy some people go on to do like consulting work i guess mm -hmm. um but mostly i mean if you end up having a career in philosophy it's teaching well some people work for think tanks i mean sometimes that happens um yeah i was one of the lucky ones who got a full-time job doing philosophy so. <laughs> The lucky, yeah. yeah. It's, it's just luck that ends up where you are exclusively, yeah. Um, a little bit of hard work, but definitely <laughs> definitely a lot of luck is involved too. Yep, absolutely. Um, so I know a lot of my community would probably potentially recognize you. You were the professor who debated Vosh in the famous water aqua H2O debate, correct? Right. Yes, yeah, that happened last May. Yes. Um, yeah, and when that, that water line, when that thing happened, I didn't really think much of it at the time, but for some reason that really resonated with <laughs> the YouTube community and yeah. became a bit of a meme for a while. Yes, I think it is still a meme. I hear it every now and then, so uh, it's it's never left. Um, did you, have you? I know you talked to Destiny after that. Have you done any other kind of social media-esque things? or? Um, I guess I've had a couple interviews just on some smaller channels. Um, I talked to that T jump fellow um, after that. That was part of like the that summer, um, and then I talk with my friend Cameron Bertuzzi sometimes. He have he has a channel called Capturing Christianity. Um, but yeah, after that, after that Vosh and Destiny thing, I, I kind of just wanted to take a break for a while. That's fair. <laughs> I yeah. don't know. I don't know how you do this consistently or regularly. <laughs> it's called a. Uh... Well, self-harm yeah it's called self-harm uh or masochism and depending on the sort of girl you're in so um i'm sure that my manager explained to you i obviously i'm not even gonna sort of begin to pretend like i know anything about philosophy obviously i'm gonna be like an armchair philosopher i like a couple of words i've taken I've, I've almost have a minor in philosophy in my like undergrad, but really like nothing advanced. Um, so I'm excited for this conversation, but I definitely want it to be oriented. Like, obviously like I'm learning from you. Um, there's probably not a lot that I'm going to be like pushing back on. Um, the reason I reached out specifically was because 
not in the debate with Vosh. I actually mostly, I heard a bit of that one. I just thought it was very silly. And so I just, I just stopped listening. So I was like, okay, this, I like good engagement. And it was just like, Vosh is not engaging with you well. The follow-up conversation you had with Destiny was super interesting. And I actually ended up like taking a whole bunch of notes about like how you were describing the way that you personally like seem to engage with philosophy or you broke philosophy down into like kind of three major categories, I believe, of philosophy. And I found that super fascinating. So I guess my hope in this is to kind of like, to some extent, get like a crash course in the way that you use and observe philosophy and kind of like a bottom up building of like, how do people engage with philosophy? Because I think it's a very abstract concept that people know the term, but they don't really like know the world at all. Yeah, right. Okay, so quick little crash course um, in philosophy. So I mean, back in the day, um, if you were remotely interested in anything scholarly or academic, um, and you weren't doing the law, you weren't a lawyer, um, and you weren't doing medicine or one of the other like trades. Um, if you were interested in anything else that was academic, academic or scholarly, you were just called a philosopher, a lover of wisdom. And um, what happened over the course of the centuries is um, back in, for, for example, ancient Greece, there were a lot of questions that were considered philosophy. Um, but over time, we started developing concepts which allowed us to ask interesting questions and then um, develop methods to answer those questions. And eventually some people took some of those questions and went and started their own areas of specialization. They just decided, I wanna do these questions. Mm -hmm. So one of the first areas to branch off was um, mathematics. Um, back in the day, I mean, if you read Plato and Aristotle and even like Pythagoras, um, you'll see all these people considered themselves philosophers. Um, even when they were doing things that we would now call mathematics. Um, so mathematics peeled off and started seeming to be its own discipline and rec recognize, its own, recognize itself as its own discipline. Mm -hmm. um, later on, um, the sciences branched off. So, I mean, Galileo called himself a natural philosopher. Um, people at that time, if they were interested in nature, they still considered themselves philosophers. They just started distinguishing themselves as natural philosophers. And it wasn't until like the 1800s that we got the word science. Okay, lots of other fields have branched off. And so what's happening yeah. is philosophy is kind of the, it's like the mother discipline that spins off sub-disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the reason I'm mentioning that is it, unless you're doing medicine or law, we didn't invent those um, or any of the trades. Um, if you are working in a field where the terminal degree is a PhD, a doctor of philosophy, then that's a little vestigial organ. That's an indication that that field came from philosophy, that it branched off of philosophy. Um, so that's why, you know, in medicine, they don't give PhDs. In study of the law, they don't give PhDs. I guess in um, optometry, you don't get a PhD. But in psychology, um, you can get a PhD. That branched off um, relatively recently, like yeah. in the late 1800s. Yeah, 1890s. Yeah, so I think that's the way to think about philosophy. It's not some weird, like, esoteric corner of the university. It's actually the center of the university. It's been spinning off subdisciplines. And then the goal eventually is to um, for philosophy to disappear, and we have no questions left, and all the questions have been asked to specialists or handed off to specialists. Um, but that doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon. Okay, so that's just kind of a bird's eye view of the discipline and what it's been doing for the last few thousand years. Um, Can I ask you a couple of questions about that before we yeah, continue on? Yeah, um, so it sounds like in the past, philosopher was essentially uh, parsimonious with an academic. Like if you were an academic, you were a philosopher. If you were a philosopher, you did academics, which included math and sciences and all sorts of things, um, which is in many ways where the PhD comes from. How do you feel then about things like PsyDs, uh, which are a new form of doctorate, doctorate in psych, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, they're called a doctorate in psychology. Um, and obviously there's a clear separation from the historical past of its connect of psychology's very, very intimate connection with philosophy. Yeah, you're gonna have to tell me about PsyDs. Um, what is the difference between a, I guess that's a doctorate of psychology, you said? Yes. Um, how is that different from a PhD? Is it more practical or clinical or something? So most PhDs have a scientist practitioner model uh, where they emphasize being empirically trained first and then training you with people second. Um, Cause they kind of believe that a good scientist who then has good people skills is gonna serve mental health best um, and do research best. In a PsyD, it usually has a scholar practitioner model. So it's all about understanding like the theories before and then people. Um, 
I'll maybe stop there before I like poison the well of outside ease at all. Oh. Well, now I'm curious. <laughs> Do they have some kind of bad reputation or something, or what's? So no. I'm not a fan of them. I'll be super clear. Uh, but I'm very OG. I'm very big on like quantitative data. I'm very big on. I, I'm much more interested in like forensic psychs and stuff like that. So I'm very data quantitative directed myself. Um, whereas CIDs often are going to be more qualitative in their research. Not always. There are CIDs that are almost identical to PhD programs, but a lot of them tend to underemphasize empiricism and more so emphasize things like schools of thought, like uh, social justice and um, kind of those branches of thought. They're going to emphasize thoughts themselves more than like data, whereas PhDs will emphasize data typically. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, as I said, I'm not super familiar with this distinction between CITES and a PhD in psychology, but the, that remark I made about how PhD is kind of like a little vestigial organ that gives us some indication about the evolutionary history of the field, um, that's just kind of an imperfect sign or indication that the field came from philosophy. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you just look at the history of psychology, it's pretty clear that, I mean, it used to be housed within departments of philosophy. Yeah. Um, and then it... Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty easy to establish that psychology did branch off from philosophy, but maybe um, more recently the names of degrees have changed. Um, but I don't think that would change the fact that psychology came from philosophy. I mean, something else that's happening these days, which is kind of unusual, is um, even like as we speak, um, business ethics and medical ethics are kind of branching off from philosophy. Mm -hmm. So it used to be that anybody teaching medical ethics like in a medical school would have a phd in philosophy or at least some background in philosophy they spend some time in a in a philosophy department but these days my understanding is some medical schools will train their own ethicists and so you might have someone teaching medical ethics who has just an md mm -hmm. um, and never really spent time in a philosophy department and something similar is happening with business ethics um so yeah the ground is shifting and changing um but yeah i think Still, the fact remains that a lot of these fields, and here, here's another way you can tell, when you start asking questions like, what is medicine? Or what is psychology? Or what right. is the mind? Um, if you start asking foundational questions about the discipline, if you find that you've sort of left the discipline and now you're doing like the philosophy of medicine or the philosophy of psychology, um, that's an indication that uh, the field has at its foundations at least some philosophy and another indication is if you look at the founders of these fields see who it was i mean often it'll trace back to somebody like aristotle um there's some more evidence that the field came from philosophy but i think what you were asking about earlier was um something more about the content of philosophy that was just sort of the form of the field mm -hmm. but i think um if you wonder what philosophers have been up to for the last uh few thousand years um, I think here's a nutshell version. Um, humans have this kind of innate tendency to think that if you want to understand how something works, you should open it up and see the parts, see how the parts like interact. So that's what we do with like machines or maybe animals or plants. You know, you can imagine like early humans opening up an animal and seeing all the parts and wondering like, how do these all work together? Um, so we kind of have that mechanistic view of um, nature, that if you want to understand some higher level phenomenon, look at a lower level mechanism and try to see how it all fits together. Okay, um, I think that humans took that into um, the study of nature generally, and in fact, sort of everything that we're interested in. So philosophers have a tendency to think like, Hmm, uh, knowledge, that's an interesting concept. I wonder what knowledge is. Mm -hmm. I, I would like more of it. Um, and I'd like to, you know, avoid believing false things. I just want to believe um, true things. I want to know as much as possible. And philosophers thought, well, here's a way to make some progress on what knowledge is. Let's open it up and see its components. Let's try to analyze it in other terms. Let's mm -hmm. try to break it into its conceptual parts and see how those concepts fit together. Okay, so if you start that process and you think that's the way to learn about reality is um, explain higher level phenomena in terms of lower level phenomena, what a lot of people think is um, eventually we're going to hit a bottom, right? Eventually this is going to bottom out. It's not going to go on forever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just like in physics, it kind of looks like it doesn't go on forever. Eventually we hit a bottom of some 
fundamental particles. Okay, and then if you ask yourself, what sorts of things could be at the bottom? What could the bottom be like? What, what could the foundation of all of reality really be like? I think there are just, um, as I said in that conversation with Destiny, I think there's really just three options. One is, um, there's sort of like two categories and one of them has two options within it. So either what's at the foundation is something like a mind, it's mental, mm -hmm. or it's physical stuff, like non-mental physical stuff. Okay, and so if you go the route that says what's at the foundation is something physical, it's non-mental, and then minds are built up out of this non-mental stuff, um, you're, you are what I, what I call and what other people call a naturalist okay. um, or a physicalist. So you think that if we keep digging and keep analyzing, eventually we're going to hit bottom and it's going to be non-mental stuff. Okay, so that's Would naturalism. Be, is this yeah. close to like materialism? Like when we say like somebody's a materialist, you're saying they're yeah. a naturalist in many ways. Yeah, so um, my understanding is these days um, people in this camp tend to think it's more accurate to describe themselves as physicalists because if you say that you're a materialist, you might unwittingly be committing yourself to a view on which the fundamental stuff is just matter. Mm. But really, there's also energy. <laughs> so they want a broader term for what's down there at the bottom, and it's just physical, the kind of stuff that physicists discover. Okay. Um, but naturalism is, I think, even a little stronger than physicalism. Naturalism is the view um, that not only is all the stuff that we're acquainted with in this universe physical, but like there are no supernatural entities. It's all just natural stuff. And yeah, difficult question. What's the difference between natural stuff and supernatural stuff? But um, naturalism is the view that there's nothing supernatural. It's all natural. And what's more, um, the natural stuff, typically they tend to think is all physical. Okay. So like all yes, things are explainable. There's no such thing as magic, essentially. <laughs> That's one way to put it. Um, uh, yeah, that might be as you said, poisoning the well a little bit against the against the other camps I'm about to mention. Um, Probably, I mean, I imagine a lot of people in my chat, at least, if they're thinking, yeah, I don't believe in magic, they would think that that is a good thing. They'd be like, yeah, of course I don't believe in magic. Like, that's well, silly. Well, very few people believe in magic. I guess it just depends on um, what do we mean by magic. And I yeah. wouldn't put it this, I wouldn't say that the naturalist is someone who thinks that everything has an explanation. Because even on naturalism, when you hit the bottom level, there will be some things that are unexplained. Right. If only stuff like, um, you know, electrons have a minus one charge. Why is that? It may well be, and it currently looks like the fact is, there is no deeper explanation. That's just the way it is. Mm. And here's another thing. Um, you know, when you get similar charges together, when you get particles together that have similar charges, they repel. Why is that? It's interesting. So even at like a naturalist perspective, when you say electrons have a negative charge and it's just the way it are, it sounds like an axiom almost. It's like, it's in many ways, like a philosophical axiom, like electrons are negative because electrons are negative and electrons are negative because electrons are negative, right? Like it's like yeah. very circular in that way. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? Am I, or am I bastardizing it? No, um, no, that's right. Um, I guess, I don't know, an axiom is typically, I thought that word was typically used for if we're like doing mathematics, what are some of the things that we take as given without needing to prove? And then hopefully we want our axioms to also be like self-evidently true. But um, with regard to this, like what we're discovering at the very bottom levels of physics, I don't know if I would describe that as axioms. It's just, we've got some fundamental particles, which means they're not made of anything smaller. And we've got some laws governing how these things interact. Um, and I think on naturalism, the, the most common view on naturalism is uh, there really are fundamental particles and fundamental laws. And to say they're fundamental means there's no deeper explanation. But this may be the sort of thing that you, you wish there were an explanation of. <laughs> like, you get two similarly charged particles together, they repel you kind of wonder why, why don't they attract? Why do they repel? And why do they repel with a certain force? Why not a stronger force or a weaker force? Um, but it looks like uh, the way a lot of naturalists describe it, people like um, Bertrand Russell and Sean Carroll, the way they describe it is what physics is going to disclose to us is the fundamental particles and the fundamental laws, and then a little clause that says, and that's just the way it is. Mm. So no deeper explanation. 
And so I wouldn't say it's circular because it's not that they say that the laws explain themselves. They're just, as philosophers say, brute. They just have no explanation. Okay. Like first order. Like there isn't a deeper, you can't really yeah, go deeper. Yeah, there's no deeper explanation. You've just really literally hit bedrock. You've hit, well, I shouldn't say literally because it's not literally bedrock. You've hit bedrock. Um, there is no deeper explanation. Right. Um, so if you have a kind of uh, reluctance to endorse magic, and magic means stuff happening with no deeper explanation, the bad news is on all these views, eventually we hit bottom and there is no deeper explanation. So there's kind of magic on all these views. Is there this thought within naturalists? Because like part of me would wonder, like, uh, I think I, I saw somebody uh, shout out to Jello in chat who said, like, is is this kind of it's what it's just the way it is? Is is there actually a presumption? It's just the way it is as for what we have right now. Or is it really, truly? Nope. That's just the way it is. Electrons are negative. There's nothing much deeper than that. No, that's a good question. So, I mean, sometimes we we humans have, I'm not a physicist, so I shouldn't say like we physicists, but we humans have reached points in the past where we thought we'd hit bedrock. So that's why atoms are called atoms, because at the time it was literally thought these are truly um, atomic in the Greek sense, like no parts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but then we found out that what we were calling atoms weren't actually atoms. They actually, they have parts. Right. Um, and so currently my understanding is I think there's about 17 fundamental particles and they're believed to be fundamental, like no further parts. Those are the true atoms in the physical world. But it may be that we find out that some of them actually have components. So you can just ask yourself, um, you can sort of uh, abstract away from the current state of our knowledge and just ask yourself, what are the possibilities for what's going to happen if we keep digging? One possibility is eventually we hit true atoms mm. and there are no further parts. Another possibility, which some philosophers believe, but I, I think it's the minority view, is what's called a gunk view, where no matter how much you keep digging and breaking apart, there's always more parts. It goes on forever, literally forever. Um, yeah, so on that view, you'd never hit a fundamental particle. It would just keep going forever. Um, so that's the gunk view. But that one's not very popular. Is it yeah, it's not very popular. Um, there are concerns about, uh, I don't know, this, this is definitely going to get us into the weeds. And I don't know how interested this is to you, but interesting this is to you. But there are concerns about whether um, causation would kind of drain away down this bottomless pit of um, down this like infinite regress of smaller and smaller bits mm -hmm. and whether explanations would drain away as well so that um, I mean it's a little bit I guess here's the here's an easy way to think about it um, so if so we're told and this is probably true that some um, earlier cultures believed that like the earth was resting on the back of elephants and the elephants were on the back of a turtle mm -hmm. um, and then you can imagine if you had lived at that time, you might wonder what's beneath the turtle. Right. Uh, okay. And so there's two possibilities. Like eventually the turtle's on something that holds it up and it, it's not just turtles forever. That's one possibility. Eventually we hit like the bottom, but another possibility is it's literally turtles all the way down. And maybe when you hear that proposal that it's turtles all the way down, we're being held up by a turtle, which is held up by a turtle, which is held up by a turtle, but there's no bottom turtle. Um, maybe you can start getting the sense of the worry that philosophers have about this sort of view. Um, if there's no bottom turtle, then what's holding this whole structure up, you know? Right. It's true that for any turtle you pick, there will be another turtle beneath it, but what's holding, what's holding all the turtles up? I'll just, I'll just give one more example that I think might be a little more intuitive. Um, so currently I have, I think I have this light on over here. If um, you asked what's powering the light bulb and I said, oh, it's getting its electricity from an extension cord. And you said, well, what's powering that extension cord? And I said, another extension cord. And you can see where this is going. Um, if I said, there's no actual plug and there's no electric, there's no um, power plant. It's just extension cords forever. <laughs> but don't worry, every extension cord gets its power from a previous extension cord. Um, for a lot of people that, that sounds not just strange, but impossible. Right. You think, you might think there, there needs to be a source of all this power. There needs to be a, a yeah, starting point. A yeah. Right. So, um, this, this, this might, I don't know what's happening in your chat, but this might 
be setting off alarm bells in some of your chat members because it sounds like an argument for God's existence. But really, this is the kind of debate that you see even among naturalists with regard to these two competing views, whether there's a foundation or whether it's bottomless gunk. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of people just turtle posting. Uh, they really like the turtle. I mean, one of my mods is like big into turtle posting, uh, where it just says turtles all the time. Um, well, maybe I should tell you about these other two views really quick, and then yeah, they're making a lot of memes. So <laughs> there's not much, there's not much deep engagement yet from the chat. So um, I said there's these sort of three possibilities, and they're in these two different camps. So one of the camps says. Um, at the bottom of everything, like if we keep digging, we're just going to find mm -hmm. and maybe it goes on forever, but it's definitely going to be non-mental. We're not going to bottom out in anything mental. So those are the naturalists. Um, in this other camp, these two views say, if you kept digging and you kept wondering what makes true things true and false things false, what's, what's at the bottom of everything? Um, these two camps say it's something mental. Um, so they agree on that. What do you mean but by mental? Camp, when I you're mean, saying mental, like, what do you mean by that? Um, something like a mind, like our own mind, something that has a will and uh, intentions and beliefs and maybe desires. Um, yeah. So, I mean, even in our own cases, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to beg any questions about whether the mind is distinct from the body, but something that's pretty apparent to anyone who thinks about it is, well, I've got this body here with all these physical characteristics mm -hmm. it's located in space and has speed and mass and so on um but then i've also got a mental life i've got um you know sensations and beliefs and desires and i it sure feels like i make choices um and then a major issue in philosophy is how do those things relate my the mental and the physical right yeah it's like the classic descartes question which people like to pretend was solved. Uh, and we're like, oh, we, we figured it out. We're not dualists anymore. And I'm like, I feel like nobody is committed to the one way or the other. It seems very up for question still. Yeah. Um, so I just mean to say that, um, yeah, when you reflect on things, it, the world seems to present itself as containing at least those two kinds of things. And maybe in the end, we'll decide it's really just one kind of thing. And that's what mm -hmm. the naturalists would say. Really, if we dug into the mind deeply enough, we would realize it's just something the brain does. And so it's just a physical phenomena, phenomenon. Um, but these other two camps say, not so. Um, really, if you wanted to explain why true things are true and false things are false, um, the explanation will have a kind of irreducible mental component. And so one of these views is um, what a lot of philosophers call supernaturalism. And so there we've got all explanations bottoming out in terms of one mind, mm -hmm. a divine mind. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like the greatest conceivable mind, all knowing, all powerful, et cetera. That's, that's the typical version of supernaturalism. Infinite, um, like infinite. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or at least, yeah, with regard to like great making properties, max, maxed out great making properties. So knowledge is good. This being has maximum knowledge. Power is good. This being has maximum power. Um, you know, it's good to be virtuous. This yeah, I was to say, is goodness good. is good, so it's maximally good. Yeah, maximally good. Okay. Um, so that's uh, the most common version of supernaturalism is, is you've got one divine mind down there, and so supernaturalists will tend to agree that yeah, you know, when we study science, we'll get um, deeper and deeper explanations in terms of particles and energy and fields and so on. But then there would be a further answer to questions like why do electrons have a minus one charge and why do similarly charged particles repel? And the answer will be in terms of the uh, intentions or goals of a divine mind of God. Okay, so that's supernaturalism. And so I guess another way you can sort of see the difference between the two views so far is both of these camps tend to agree that there was a big bang. Naturalists tend to say um, either there was no explanation for why the big bang happened or there was, but it's like previous bangs or previous states of the universe. Supernaturalists say there's an explanation of why the Big Bang happened and guess what it was. <laughs> it was God Divine. Yeah. Um, saying, let there be light or whatever. Okay, um, so that's naturalism and supernaturalism. And then the third option, which I think is kind of the dominant view these days in the university at least, and increasingly in the popular culture, 
is a view on which um, truth is everything that's true is ultimately explained in terms of something mental, but it's not one divine mind. It's the creative activity of our minds, plural. So our minds are what explains why truths are true and why what's false is false. So for example, um, an example that this camp likes to bring out is something like, um, how many continents are there? Everybody knows, uh, if you were raised in a certain time and place, everybody knows <laughs> there are seven continents. Um, so that's true, there are seven continents. But what makes that true? On this third view that I'm describing now, the answer is us. Our thoughts, our language, our decisions, mm. our, um, the decisions we made with respect to what categories to apply, um, which, what definitions to adopt, they would say. So we made it true that there are seven continents. We could have made it otherwise, um, but we, we made it true that there's seven. And um, on the continent question, most people are willing to say like, yeah, you know, there's something right about that. Um, we also made it true in American football that touchdowns are worth six points. And most people are like, yeah, we did make that true. Um, we made it true in the United States um, that you should drive on the right side of the road. Other people did it differently, but those are the conventions we adopt. We adopted. Yeah, we made that true. Okay, but then when it gets a little controversial is when you start applying this to things like um, history and science and morality and mathematics. <laughs> then it starts looking a little less appealing. But um, the consistent advocate of this view will say in all of these areas, um, the only kind of truth is truth by convention, the sort of truth that we created, that we invented. And so I, I call this third camp, um, I didn't come up with this name, but it's not, I wouldn't say this is a very common name. Um, I got it from a philosopher named Alvin Plantinga. I don't know if he got it from someone else, but. Um, he calls this camp creative anti-realism. Creative anti-realism. It's anti-realism because you, if you ask this sort of person, um, well, how many continents are there really? They'll say, there's no, there's no answer to that question. There's, there are no continents really. <laughs> um, there are just, you know, a certain number for this culture. And then this culture came up with a different number. And that's the end of the story. Same thing with morality. Um, I mean, what makes you a moral relativist is you say, well, you know, abortion is wrong for this culture, but it's right according to this culture. And then if you ask a relativist, well, is it right or wrong, period? Is it right or wrong for real? They'll say you've misunderstood the way morality works. It's all just conventions. Okay, so it's anti-realism for that, for that reason. Um, if you ask them to like peel back our conceptual schemes and describe the world as it really is, they'll say you've misunderstood. <laughs> as right. soon as you peel back the conceptual schemes, reality is ineffable. As soon as I try to describe it, I'm putting another conceptual scheme on it. Okay, so it's anti-realism like that, but it's creative because they'll still tell you, oh yeah, there are, there are things that are true and false. Like everybody knows there's seven continents, but we made it true. We created that truth. Okay, sometimes this view goes by the name postmodernism, but I like to call it creative anti-realism because postmodernism can give you the impression that it's sort of new and up to date, but actually this is a very, very old view. Mm. And in ancient Greece, like in the pre-Socratics, you would find advocates of all three of these views, naturalism, supernaturalism, creative anti-realism. And you can kind of chart their fortunes over time as though you're charting stock prices over time. and Sometimes um, supernaturalism has been in the lead. Sometimes naturalism um, was top dog. Um, but these days, I think naturalism has been eclipsed by creative anti-realism. And so we're living in a culture where creative anti-realism is the dominant view. Okay. So that's, I've never heard somebody call the postmodernist creative anti-realism, um, except for obviously like you before. So how how because i i feel like when i come across postmodernists i see like a blend of most postmodernists are like postmodernists about like constructed things but things like relating to like biology or physics they might be more of like a naturalist and uh, they kind of like blend the two do you find when people are like engaging in their own forms of like self-philosophy at least do people really fall into like these three camps neatly or do most people kind of pull a little bit from all three um 
Well, I th yeah, so I think that's a that's a good question. So um, there, there certainly could be people like this, and probably we all are like this to some degree. Um, we probably all have confused, incoherent views of the world, and so we might have views, we might have beliefs that are in tension. And so on some topics, I might give you answers that imply that creative anti-realism is true. But on other topics, I might give you answers that imply that supernaturalism is true. Right. And so maybe for a lot of people, we just have inconsistent views of the world. But another possibility is you might think, um, so I myself am a supernaturalist. I'll just put my cards on the table. Um, but I think that's consistent with thinking that there are some things that are true just by convention. and. I go back and forth on this, and I, I wonder whether this is I, don't know, I wonder whether this is really the case, but I think it's totally consistent to say, like, yeah, you know, that a touchdown is worth six points was made true by us. Mm -hmm. But that's not how all truths are. And I could give you an explanation of why we did that in 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 deeper terms. And when I hit bottom, for me, it'll be in terms of one divine mind. Right. And maybe a naturalist could say the same. A naturalist could say, yeah, okay, um, we made it true that you should drive on the right side of the road. That in the U.S., they made that true. Um, but we can explain that in terms of physics, <clears throat> ultimately. What was going on in everybody's brains what, when they made this decision. Um, we can explain why that was happening in their brains. Trace this explanation down to the bottom turtle or whatever, and it's all given in terms of physics. Um, so yeah, I guess in that way, it could be that you could think that there are some things that are true by convention without thinking everything's true by convention or right. fundamentally it's just convention. Right. Um, the creative anti-realist says everything that's true is true by convention. Outside of convention, there are no truths. That's like the consistent creative anti-realist view. At the very bottom, um, as Protagoras put it, um, man is the measure of all things, of of what is the case that it is the case and what is not that it's not right um that's the consistent creative anti-realist view so i, I guess i should just yeah uh, i'll just real quick insert this mm -hmm. if your chat or if your audience is thinking well yeah i think i think humans did make it the case that touchdowns are worth six points that's not enough to be a creative anti-realist you've got to think like what's really at the foundation of my view what's at the very bottom right do i do i think all truth is truth by convention um, if not, you're probably not a creative anti-realist. Right. I guess that gets actually to my question. So I was going to be like, the first two, I can kind of see where first order beliefs come from, right? Supernatural, it's, it's God, right? In the case yeah. of naturalist, it's there's some explainable natural phenomenon or some sort of physical energy phenomenon occurring at the yeah. core of it. What is the, is the foundation, like the, is the first order thought then of the postmodernist basically us? It's like yeah. physics doesn't really matter. Thermodynamics is us. Um, yeah. Well, let me let me make sure I understand the question. Um, because here's a here's here's a question that might be arising, um, and I think you might be giving voice to this because a really common question for the for the creative anti-realist is, uh, well, what's reality really like? Like you've you've told me about humans and the conventions we adopted, but where did we come from? You know, what explains humans ourselves? What explains? Surely there's an explanation of our own minds. Mm -hmm. like that. Um, tell me about the history of humans. Didn't we evolve by natural means, possibly superintended by a god? Maybe not, but don't we have an origin story? And, you know, aren't we made of things? <laughs> you know, aren't the physicists up to something? Um, so I've certainly asked this of creative anti-realists, and they've written a lot about it. And I think a consistent creative anti-realist will say something like this. Um, if you are asking about what reality was like before us, or what reality is like independent of our minds and our conceptual schemes. Again, it's like you're asking me to peel back my conceptual schemes, which means set aside all the words I would use and now tell you what reality is really like. And I can't do that according to the creative anti-realist. I can't peel back all the words I would use to describe reality and then describe reality. Um, so they think that is impossible. Um, they think that reality itself doesn't, as Richard Rorty put it, doesn't divide itself into sentence-shaped chunks called facts. There are no facts out there to, like, correspond to our sentences. So you can't, like, peel back our sentences and just tell me what the facts are. Um, so if you ask them, like, where did humans come from, they'll tell you the common story. They'll say, yeah, you know, here's what, here's what everyone knows to be true. Um, you know, the universe is 13.5 billion years old or whatever. Um, but if you ask them... 
Um, well, independent of like what we've discovered by way of science or independent of these conce conceptual schemes we're applying, what was history really like or something like that? Um, they'll say, I can't, I can't answer that question for you. Or when you ask them, yeah, if you ask them, like, there, there are some really consistent creative anti-realists who will say this even about things like quarks and electrons and fundamental particles. They'll say that all of this quark talk is the upshot of particle physicists' practice. I think that's, um, I think his name was Andrew Pickering, and I think the book was called Constructing Quarks, if I'm remembering correctly. And I'm pretty sure that's a line from the book. Um, the existence of quarks was the upshot of particle physicist practice. And so that, that sounds an awful lot like um, what he's saying is um, the existence of quarks was not inevitable. And in fact, it was something that we constructed or we built right. quarks themselves, our social constructions. So yeah, maybe I should have mentioned that earlier, but all this talk one hears these days of social constructions, um, that's the kind of talk that is most at home in a creative anti-realist view. Okay. So for example, when you were talking with Vosh about like the water question, were you getting fundamentally to like a creative anti-realist thing where he was kind of trying to like, be like, what do these words really mean? And like, we call it water because we've decided to label that, but like, blah, blah, blah. Was that, was that the tension that was going on there and why everyone was like, wait, what? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I didn't know that I was going to encounter that much resistance. I had just, I was just trying to think of an example of something that was true before humans came along. Um, for some other reason that I can't even remember, <laughs> but I just was like, well, you know, it's certainly possible for there to be truths even before humans came along, right? Like, for example, that water is H2O. Um, but then he, he fought me on that, and that is um, what a creative anti-realist would do. Okay. So if you ask them a question like, um, yeah, I don't, I don't remember if I said this to Destiny or not, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but it was something like, if you ask a creative anti-realist a question like, um, were there dinosaurs before humans? Something like that. They'll say, of course, everybody knows that. Were there dinosaurs before humans? Yes, there were dinosaurs before humans. But if you put that temporal operator out front and say, before humans, was it true that there were dinosaurs? Then they'll say no. <laughs> because they think the only things that can be true or false are sentences. And what makes sentences true or false are our conventions. And so if you're asking me before humans came along, then what you're asking me to imagine is a situation where there are no sentences, there are no conventions. And now you're asking me in that situation, was it true that there were dinosaurs? No, because there were no sentences and no conventions. But if you just ask them about this sentence now with our current conventions, were there dinosaurs before humans? They'll say, yeah, that sentence now, given our conventions, is true. Everybody knows that. Right. Um, so I think Vosh has that kind of view. Um, so I was asking him, like, you know, before humans came along, was it true that water was H2O? And I think a consistent creative anti-realist will say no. They'll say no. <laughs> um, and so I think the reason he brought up, you know, south of the border, it's called aqua. <laughs> he meant to say agua, but he said, he just pointed out that in other languages they call it something else, is I think what he was trying to say was, the so-called truth that you're asking me to consider that water is H2O, um, that's just true like around here because of conventions we've adopted in this language game we're playing. Mm -hmm. If you went to another culture speaking a different language, playing a different language game, it wouldn't be true that water is H2O. They wouldn't even understand what that sentence was. They would have a, they'd have a different sentence. Um, so yeah, I think that the resistance I got on that point was probably because um, Vosh is an adherent of this creative anti-realist view. Okay, that makes sense. Interesting. So you said that- My understanding is this might be kind of popular in the YouTube sphere, this sort of creative anti-realist. Yeah, yeah, I mean- In the debate community. Points to Vosh, he's probably one of the more consistent people in the space of that worldview. I think a lot of them most people, I think, definitely pick and pull a fair bit from all of them. Probably most people in the YouTube space would pick and pull from like postmodernism to like naturalism. Um, there's not a ton of like supernaturalists, obviously. Um, but yeah, most people I think would pick and pull between the two. Whereas like Vosh, I think, is at least like, I'll give him kudos, like he's very, very consistent in like the willing to say, no, what is water? It's just a semantics. It's just strange because it feels like their like ground presumption is what is truth? It's like a semantics game. And it's just like, 
it's such an unsatisfying answer, I suppose. Like every, every other fee, like group or body of thought is a more satisfying answer, I suppose. But that's probably my bias and proclivity as well. Yeah. See, so, yeah, I think that's what was happening there. Um, although, I mean, sometimes people will say things like this, and I don't, I'd have to rewatch the debate, but it might have been that Vosh was willing to say that hydrogen predates us. Um, he often says, like, the territory exists, but how we map it is up to us, or the categories that we apply is up to us. Right. Um, so that sounds like something a creative anti-realist would say, but then you definitely shouldn't say anything about the territory. If I ask you, what's the territory like? You shouldn't say something, you shouldn't say, well, fundamental particles, um, you know, interacting with fields and whatnot. You can't say anything about the territory mm -hmm. because as soon as you start describing the territory, you're putting like another map on it. Um, but I think, at least sometimes in the debate, it seemed like maybe Vosh was willing to say there are some bits of reality that are mind independent. Like maybe, maybe for example, gender terms like woman and man, those are um, social constructions. But there really are realities about humans interacting with each other and adopting various kinds of um, styles of dress and presentation. That's all real. But the woman man gender stuff that's an artificial imposition um but i think a, a consistent creative anti-realist couldn't say even that about this bottom level you can't start describing these as humans um with styles of dress you literally can't you can't articulate or describe reality as it is in itself mm. and if you have some people in the chat who've taken a little philosophy this start, might start sounding a lot like Immanuel kant and i think that's modern creative anti-realism traces back to Kant. Really? So yeah. Yeah. So Kant's thought, you know, the things in themselves are unknowable, indescribable. Um, we're imposing categories on the things in themselves. Um, so there are certainly truths, um, but they're made true by these categories that we bring to the world. The world itself is indescribable, unknowable, the things in themselves. Um, so yeah, Kant did this sort of bifurcation. Um, of things in themselves and you know the phenomena that we categorize um I, is, I think that's that's a classic kind of creative anti-realism is that where he universal rule of like i believe it's lying right where he says like is he pulling that because he's saying like at a universal level of all conventions if we like allowed this convention of lying we couldn't universally apply it it can't like work within us or society and therefore like lying must always be wrong because at a societal level, we can't allow for lying. Is that where he pulls it from, or is that just like other shit? Um, well, yeah, we should probably ask an actual specialist in Kant. My, I will give you my impression as somebody who is um, just acquainted with Kant. Um, I would answer that, no, those two views are independent. Okay. He's got one view about like the nature of perception and our contact with the world, but then he also has like views in ethics. Um, and I don't know if like, if you adopt one, you have to adopt the other. I, I kind of doubt it. I don't think there's any sort of entailment between the two. Um, yeah, so no, I think this this universalizability test that you were describing, I think that's independent of the, the view he has about our contact with the world. Okay, so what you're describing here, again, from my baby, baby perspective is like epistemic beliefs, like core epistemic beliefs about like how the world is and how it works, right? Am I correct in understanding that? Because my question is, how do we go from these three categories into like morals and ethics? Like, where does this branch off? Oh. Um, well, I wouldn't describe these these beliefs that we've been talking about um, as I wouldn't say we've really done any epistemology yet. So far, this has been metaphysics. I think okay. we're, we're sort of wondering what's most real, what's what's fundamental. And so we're asking what exists and we're thinking about what philosophers would call grounding so like what grounds what what explains what and if i kept asking why questions if i kept like a child you know asking why is that true what makes that true what would happen would eventually we stop and hit hit a foundation right so yeah so far we've been just thinking about um a really big question in metaphysics um so i would call these what we've been talking about is what's fundamental mm -hmm in a metaphysical sense, um, what's most real. Yeah, um, so that's what we've been talking about so far. And then you had wondered, well, how does morality fit into this? So I guess maybe I'll have to back it up. So we were talking about uh, metaphysics. 
and I'm trying to like, I'm a big categorizer, obviously myself. So I'm thinking like, okay, is metaphysics kind of like this larger branch that things like ethics, like our philosophy of ethics and like epi epistemology, does that fall kind of underneath metaphysics? Once you have a metaphysics belief, now you can branch into these other two or what's their relation? Or maybe there isn't like this hierarchical organization. I'm not sure. Um, the way I think about it, and I think this is pretty typical is um, there isn't really a hierarchy Epistemology is not a kind of metaphysics, and ethics isn't a kind of metaphysics. Really, these are just three different kinds of questions we could be asking. Mm. When we're asking questions about what exists and what's real, so when we ask questions like, does God exist? Do I have free will? Um, what is the relationship between the mind and the body? These are questions about what exists and what's real. And so in philosophy, we'd say we're doing metaphysics now. Um, we're talking about what is. When we're talking about how we know, or what do we know, um, then we're doing epistemology. So that's just from the Greek word for knowledge, episteme, it's the study of knowledge. Um, so when you're asking questions like, how do you know? What do you know? Can you know that? Um, and when you're using words like, um, is this rational or reasonable or justified? When we're asking questions like that, we're doing epistemology. Um, when we're asking questions like, what should I do? How should I live? Um, should uh, euthanasia be legal or something like that? When we're, when we're asking should questions, um, then we're doing ethics. So yeah, I guess the way you can recognize these three fields is if you're asking is questions, like what exists, what is, you're doing metaphysics. When you're asking questions about knowledge and justified belief and rationality, you're doing epistemology. Um, when you're asking should questions or ought questions, good, bad questions, um, you're doing ethics. But I'll just quickly add that these aren't like clearly distinguished categories all the time. There are mm -hmm. some questions in philosophy that kind of blur the boundaries. And like you can be doing ethics, but if you start asking questions like, what is the good? <laughs> what is the nature of the good? You're kind of doing metaphysics, but in, a, in ethics. Um, and when you're asking questions like, does knowledge exist? Um, what is a belief? It sounds like you're doing epistemology, but you're also asking is questions. So you're kind of doing like metaphysics within epistemology. Right. So yeah, sometimes these fields blur together. So it's just a kind of... And they would inform well, each other, right? Like how we know things, if you believe in like a divine God, your answer to that, to like an epistemic question might be informed in part by your metaphysics assumptions about the world and what you should do is probably in many ways informed by that as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so it's awfully hard to do like one of these fields independently of the others. Yeah, you can't really do them in isolation. Um, right. Your answers in one area are probably gonna influence your answers in the other area. But yeah, it's just a kind of a rough and ready categorization scheme, but um, I think that is how philosophers tend to think about it. And then maybe there's like a fourth field logic if you're just thinking about logical relations, P's and Q's, you don't even have to mention the content of the P's and the Q's, um, then you're doing logic. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's what's left in philosophy these days after we lost psychology, um, we lost linguistics, we're losing medical ethics and bioethics, we lost science, okay, whatever. Um, this is what's left, well, this is all we've got left is these four fields. That actually leads me back to a question I had before we, I kind of, I think it was my fault. I derailed us into the metaphysics stuff, but um, I was thinking a lot about like the academic history of philosophy as being like kind of the backbone of most of our fields, but how in many ways <laughs> I kind of view philosophy as um, the unappreciated, neglected parent in the university, where like there's an element where probably, especially like I, I shouldn't speak. So I, I have my background in psychology, right? So when I think about psychology, I was really lucky that all of my supervisors were like, again, a lot of these OG people are very big on like, you need to know your philosophy too. Like you need to be reading James. You need to know where we come from. You need to know like some of the philosophical presumptions. Do you believe in like fun, like pragmatism and, and all these sorts of things? Um, but in many ways, so many people, for example, in psychology, like a ton of my colleagues basically have no, like, I mean, clearly I have almost no grounding in philosophy, but it's interesting to me in that like we're not even really taught it like we're taught ethics as far as like what our college says and like how we're supposed to conduct ourselves with clients but we're not really taught anything beyond that but when it comes to particularly things like human flourishing and like the mind it feels like necessarily entangled with philosophy like 
because so many of the things that seem to cause is why I love like things like, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of like existential therapy, but existential therapy is a very philosophical form of therapy because it's talking about like universal fears that all humans must wrestle through, right? Like birth and death and being alone and like, who am I and what's my purpose and questions like that, that are deeply philosophical. There isn't like an empirical answer to who am I and what's my purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think what you were pointing out is in psychology, you've got some people who um, do emphasize the importance of philosophy and thinking about foundational questions within your field. Um, but then it sounded like you were saying there are some other psychologists who think that that is irrelevant and we should just... I think they just don't um, think about it is more so. There's like a yeah. small group that thinks about it and then the rest, I think, just don't think about it yeah. at all. Yeah. Yeah. Something I have a... Um, by, by no means am I an expert in this, but I'm, I, I'm interested in interpretations of quantum mechanics. And so I read like physicists who can try to translate that to me and explain to me what's going on. And the impression I get from reading them is there's a similar kind of um, division within physicists. There are some who think, no, we really should be asking these like fundamental questions, like what's most real? What kind of category should we be using? Should we rethink everything? Um, but then there's other physicists and my understanding, my impression is this is, a kind of dominant attitude um and the attitude is something like you should just shut up and calculate <laughs> like don't don't ask fundamental questions about what these theories mean um just use the formulas just use the equations and you know make predictions run the experiments but don't ask the deeper questions um so again i'm not a physicist but if i if i'm understanding that right it sounds like maybe that's happening in um psychology as well and I guess now that I think about it, um, when I was an undergrad working in biology, I, I worked in labs a lot. And so I got a pretty clear picture of what my life would be like if I went on that research science route. And I remember there were there was a similar kind of division in the lab. I guess even then at that age, I had kind of philosophical dispositions. And so I was asking philosophical questions like, where did life come from? What is life? Are viruses alive? And stuff like this, you know? I was asking questions about kind of like the philosophy of biology. And some people in the lab were really interested in it and they would have conversations with me, but others in the lab were like, what are you talking about? Can you please shut up? <laughs> um, and they were really just repulsed by the whole, the whole attitude. Um, so maybe that happens in biology as well. So I, I guess I would just say this about that. Um, of naturally, no surprise, I'm on the side of the people who are more philosophically <laughs> minded. And, what? Crazy. Yeah, yeah. Unexpected. Some, yeah, here's just a bit of evidence that comes to mind. Um, so... Einstein, Albert Einstein was responsible for some major conceptual shifts in the history of physics. And um, I think it's pretty well known that he was deep in the philosophy. He was like deeply influenced by philosophy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of his major contributions to physics were th just pure thought experiments, right? He didn't actually run any like empirical, not, not all the time, but often like the major contributions were just thought experiments. Um, that were really important and really insightful and opened the door for a lot of progress in physics. Yeah. And so I think that if physicists are of the mind that, you know, just shut up and calculate, don't think about the fundamental issues, then unfortunately the field might stagnate more than it otherwise would if they were, if they were willing to think deeply about fundamental questions. And, may, and probably the same thing's true in psychology. Yeah, I mean, a lot of like... <laughs> um axiom breaking like worldview shifting research definitely came off of somebody who was just willing to like poke questions at fundamental assumptions right that's like in biology often relates to like epigenetics my understanding not that i'm a biologist by any means but a lot of i think the original people who were really trying to point at things like epigenetics they necessarily had to like look at the axioms of like dna is all and be like but is it though like is it really that why are we assuming this right uh, which is Fundamentally, it's starting off as like a, I mean, it is a philosophical question because in many ways, hypothesis generation, especially when we're talking about like free basic science is philosophizing. You're just thinking about shit. Like it sounds fancy when you say philosophizing, you're just saying like, I'm just thinking about things, um, which you can do anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of philosophers talking to specialists in these fields. Um, and I don't know, you, you would probably know more about this than I would. I've never really applied for a grant or anything, but um, I wonder whether maybe if there's if there's anybody at fault here maybe some of the fault lies at the feet of like agencies that issue money because mm -hmm. if you like 
said, here's what I want to do. If, if Einstein had written like a grant proposal, like, here's what I want to do. I just want to think about like, you know, the nature of time and space. Um, I don't know if he would have gotten any money for that, um, especially early in his career. Um, so you, in order to like get the grant money, you kind of have to have a very well formulated question that fits into like an already very well established research area. Yeah. But this is going well beyond my expertise. I don't really know. I mean, that's right, but... yeah, that's an interesting question because it's something my chat always complains about it being like, why does nobody ever bring up economics and like all of these questions of like institutional like failings? Because money talks like money's off oftentimes the biggest driver. Why assume something pernicious and nasty when like just simply like money incentives don't exist uh, would probably suffice as an answer. Yeah. And then I guess just the contrarian in me wants to speak up on behalf of these grant making agencies. If I were in their position, maybe I would do the same thing because you're sort of held responsible for outcomes. And so if you get a proposal from some young person named Albert Einstein who says, I just want to think about the nature of time and space, <laughs> or you get a proposal from somebody who has like a very well-defined, well-established track record and they're yeah. asking a question that you're familiar with and you can see how this is probably going to produce some results. I guess if I were in that position, I'd probably give it to the, the person yeah, you're hedging your bets, right? Yeah. What's the probability that this person coming along is the next Einstein or it's just like some weird kid who like is right. going to completely flop and produce no results? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so this might be one of those unfortunate situations where nobody's really at fault. Things could be much better than they are, but nobody's really at fault and it's hard to see how to change things. <laughs> right. Do you yeah. see like the schisming where like things are branching off of philosophy? Because oftentimes I hear like a lot of people will say education would just be improved if we went back to like teaching kids philosophy and grammar. Like if we just taught everyone the basics of philosophy and grammar, probably everyone would be significantly more educated and the world would be a better place. Do you agree with that presumption of like, should philosophy be like this cordoned unit within the university or should it be like, naturally infused into any every and all things because it affects almost every and all things yeah um well i've had to think about that pretty carefully because um my wife and i do have one daughter and we've had to make decisions about her education and we've decided to go with a more sort of classical education and it's not certainly not just philosophy but um yeah it's a little more old school and traditional and certainly there's a lot of grammar um yeah and if is she homeschooled? Me, if I, it, um, where'd you find, is this a private school or homeschooling? She is homeschooled. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, you're not going to find that in a public education system. So yeah. And I think we're about at the age where we're going to start doing logic. Like every year I think about it, like, is she ready for logic yet? Um, and I think next year, I think she's ready. Um, so I'd like to do that with her, but uh, I certainly, so I don't think that children, by no means should they only do philosophy. No, right. definitely not. And that probably comes later in their development so that they'd be in a position to appreciate philosophy. But I do think it's a little bit um, regrettable that it seems to me that um, the only way that in our current educational system, the only way you learn logic is kind of accidentally and largely through mathematics. You, you kind of start picking up on logical principles just by doing math mm -hmm. because there it's like clear what follows and what doesn't. And you've got like rule, um, sort of, you know, little algorithms that you're supposed to follow, little processes that you're supposed to follow, and you can break the rules and so on. And so I think insofar as people pick up logic through a contemporary educational system, it's through mathematics. And unfortunately, um, I don't, I'm not the first one to notice this, but there's a lot of mathematics classes that people don't end up using very much. And I think they would be better served by just doing logic. <laughs> I wish I wish high schools had like an option to just study logic mm -hmm. um, because I think that would benefit everybody um, instead of learning it accidentally by learning math and most of the math you're learning, you'll probably forget. Um, I think, yeah, a lot of people would benefit just by learning logic. But and then in addition, oh, sorry, I was just, yeah, I was just going to say really quickly, um, mm -hmm. kids are kids are natural philosophers. And they love asking philosophical questions. Like I remember when my daughter was younger and she'd have her friends over, I just like kind of sprinkle in a philosophical question into the conversation just to see what they did with it. And it was really amazing um, how naturally they took to it. Um, and so I don't, yeah, I don't think that kids can't learn philosophy or wouldn't benefit from it. I think they would benefit greatly from it. Um, learning how to think carefully and logically about some deeper questions. I think that would be enormously beneficial, but. Mm. No surprise that I'm saying that as a philosopher. Yeah, for sure. I just, um, have you ever heard of the, it's a very, very new field called uh, mental, mental immunology? 
Oh. Okay. You might find it really interesting, actually. So it's uh, spearheaded by a bunch of different people. It kind of, I believe somebody in my chat is going to screech at me if I say this wrong and I'm going to, but I believe it comes out of like the rationalist movement in large part, but it's basically this question of kind of what you're talking about, which is like, can we teach people how to think well? So not what ideas they should have, but how to like challenge fallacies, how to challenge like cognitive biases, how to like notice when they're using a really bad heuristic to come to a presumption about the world that just like with pretty minimal testing, you can be like, oh yeah, that doesn't really make any sense, right? Which it seems seems like obviously we have like current time bias where we always want to be like and times are just terrible right now compared to in the past i'm sure that's probably not the case right but in like the 90s i, I was a 90s kid growing up so i went to school during the 90s uh dominant in the early 2000s critical thinking skills were always taught in school um and the mental immunology field kind of points to this and be like this is not actually improved people's ability to critically think it's mostly just taught kids to have really strong opinions um without actually like really testing or vetting them um and like how being confident to have strong opinions i guess is one thing but being able to properly test them and like engage in like some sort of like i idea wrestling is probably more important. I'm not sure what you think. It's a really interesting field um, that I have some issues with because um, it sometimes falls into presuming what is right to think because it presumes an answer to what is right, right? Like, how do we get people to believe in climate change? And it's like, well, that shouldn't really be the goal of right thinking. Okay. The goal should be, how do we get people to engage with the data of climate science to come to reasonable conclusions about it, right? Like that would be the real goal in my mind. I'm not sure what you think about that. So you're saying mental immunology is um, more it favors the latter where we're just teaching them how to think instead of yes them all the good reasons to believe in climate change or something like that yes Whereas somewhat some of the some of, i will say there's a little bit of both that happens um like any any critical analysis group yeah but. i guess i would be very interested to um learn about that because it, it sounds like what we're just doing in philosophy all day every day is a kind of mental immunology or sort of improving yeah. our mental hygiene and um I think it's safe to say that we have learned some things about better and worse methods for doing this. And um, to be honest, I think that's really the main reason philosophers are still employed by universities. And the sort of the reason we're asked to teach students anything really is um, not because like we're going to teach them the details of like the free will debate or um, we're going to look at all the various theories of consciousness. I mean, that's all interesting, but really, I think the reason universities employ philosophers is um, they're hoping that the method that we use to investigate these questions will be conveyed to the students. Right. Um, and the method we use is basically um, thinking in terms of arguments, like trying to figure out what the conclusion of this argument is. What's this person trying to convince me of? And then thinking about the reasons and, you know, um, ordering them in such a way that it's clear how these reasons are meant to entail the conclusion. Mm -hmm. And then of learning how to evaluate reasons, learning how to evaluate premises. Um, that's basically my job, and that's how I make a living. <laughs> that, in a nutshell, is what we do. Um, and so, yeah, if your question was, should we teach that to kids? Oh, for sure. I, I tried to do it with my own daughter when she was younger, like when she was really young, like three or four. I would start introducing to her the concept of a counterexample. So a counterexample is just whenever somebody thinks or reasons, um, they're moving from one thought to another thought. And mm -hmm. they're saying like, well, here are all the things that, you know, candidate X promises to do if he's elected. Right. I should vote for candidate X. So they just made like an inference. They said, here's, here are some facts. Candidate X promises to do such and such. Therefore, I should vote for um, candidate X. So anytime anybody thinks or reasons, you can represent their thought in the form of a if-then statement. If candidate X promises to do such and such, then I should vote for candidate X. Um, so those sorts of if-then statements are really important and really fundamental and just capture the essence of human thought and rationality. Mm -hmm. And the only way that an if-then statement can be false is if you can think of how the if part could be true but the then part could be false. So like, how could it be that candidate X promises to do all these things? And yet, nevertheless, I, pr I probably shouldn't vote for him. Well, maybe there's other things that he promises to do that I didn't know about. Or, 
you know, maybe there's other considerations that I didn't pack into that antecedent. He promises to do all these things, but also he's, he's secretly a fascist or something. I don't know. Um, so you can kind of see how you can generate counterexamples to these, these if-then statements. Hmm. So I used to do that with my daughter. I would say, like, hey, what do you think, true or false? Um, like, all the chickens in our backyard are brown. What do you, is that true? And you can translate that to a conditional. Like, if there's a chicken in our backyard, then it's brown. And she could naturally and easily think of counterexamples. She'd be, no, that's false. You know, there's um, a white chicken. Yeah, Lucy is white or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so I've tried to do that with her throughout her whole life. Just teach her to think in terms of counterexamples, because I think that's, that's the most important, um, most fundamental bit of human reasoning. All the stuff that the debate community seems to be attracted to, like learning Latin names for fallacies. If you just understand what a counterexample is, you don't have to know the names of these fallacies. You can just see them when they happen. Right. You'll see like somebody insults you and then concludes that you're wrong. So what they've done is they've, they've said like, well, if you're stupid, then you're wrong. Right. And you can clearly see that doesn't follow. You can just generate counterexamples. Well, maybe, you know, isn't it possible for a stupid person to be right? Um, or yeah, so all those... All those Latin names for fallacies are just, they're, they're sort of missing the core phenomenon, which is just the concept of a counterexample. Interesting. So I, I, wish, I, wish, I wish kids would just be taught that. That would be enough. I'd be satisfied. <laughs> if they like, I wish in my logic class I had been taught that actually of like breaking yeah. down. Because I remember, so in my university, I did take a logic course because it was either doing linear algebra and calculus or logic. And I was like, we're going to do logic, which was probably not the best choice. I actually think I probably would have done better overall and had less work to do. Because uh, I believe, I believe it, like when we're talking about logic, I remember having to like convert sentences into like symbols to do like math, basically like logic math to figure out if the statement was true. It's been so long, I you could for the life of me do it now. Um, but when I like look back at that class learning, I mean, we had to learn like all the formal and informal fallacies and all that stuff. Um, that class was probably, I wish I had taken it earlier. I took it in like my four, I think my third year spring course. Cause I just like needed to get that elective out of the way. And I, so I had to rush through it. And I remember getting to the end of the class and being like, oh my gosh, I should have taken this first year. And I wish I could have like, I wish I could have two semesters. I wish I could have one of these classes at least like once a year as like a little reminder of how to do this. Because I like, I, I noticed like my, my thinking itself, which I think is like the key. Cause in, when we're talking about like thinking right, people are always afraid of like, when you're saying thinking right, do you just mean have your opinion? And it's like, no, it can't mean that. It must not mean that because that's not about thinking right. That's about having the right opinion, right? What we have to do is like teach people how to go Okay, he's saying that, right, think about my, my in-laws, right? The vaccine is going to kill you within a year. I'm like, okay, is there any evidence of people just like spontaneously dying from the vaccine after a year? Okay, well, there was no evidence of that. So then their, their claim changed to, well, you must have gotten the placebo version. I'm like, okay, well, there is no evidence that a bunch of placebo versions were sold by any means, unless there's a whole bunch, like, right? So you can like immediately come up about like, why would this even make sense and walking it through? And I just feel like so much of like what is leading to political division in many times, like to me breaks down to like actual, like just bad logic. And I'm not even an expert in it. Like I wish I was, to be honest. Um, um, but when I like listen to people's arguments and thought processes, I'm like, I don't want you to agree with me. I just wish that you could see like how this is falling apart really, really quickly. Yeah. Um, so I don't mean to contradict you, but another thing you could do, um, and I'm not going to contradict you, but um, it sounded like what you were doing when you imagined this conversation with your in-laws was they say something and then you sort of directly attack it with your own argument, which is great. And we do that in philosophy all the time. But something else you could do um, and I think this might just be useful life advice if you want to have like friendly conversations where the relationship is not irreparably damaged is you can just ask people, well, why do you, why do you think that? Um, and you have to be careful with your tone. And this is something I struggle with. You can't say like, well, why do you think that? Um, but you have to say like, oh, I didn't know that. How do you, how do you know that? Or how do you know that's true or something like that? And then wait for them to supply you their reasons. Um, so they'll say something like, well, the vaccine's going to, kill you immediately or something like that right if you just ask like oh my goodness i didn't know that um how do you know that or something like why, why do you think that and then what you'll often find is sometimes they just won't even have a reason <laughs> you know right i'll just be like oh i heard it on facebook or something like that and facebook like, stories yeah oh 
Yeah, so, you know, sometimes I've heard things on Facebook that weren't true, though, you know? Um, I wonder if that's really true. We should look into it or something like that. Um, or maybe they'll give you a reason. They'll cite a study, and then you can say, like, oh, that's really interesting, you know, that I would be scared if these vaccines were going to kill me in a month. Let's look at the study. And then you could maybe show them how the study doesn't say what they think it says. Um, and what's what I've learned through... Oh boy, 25 years of arguing on the internet and um, doing philosophy in person is people are more receptive to changing their minds when um, you ask them to explain their views in a kind of friendly, non-confrontational way. You just ask them like, oh, well, why do you think that? Because what often happens is um, people discover for themselves the, the shallowness of their explanations. Mm -hmm. And a famous example of that... Um, I think it's, I don't know, from the literature on this sort of thing. can't remember exactly where it came from, but if you just ask people, how does a toilet work? Or, sorry, if you ask people, do you know how a toilet works? People are like, of course, I use toilets every day. <laughs> I don't want to brag, but I'm really familiar. Um, so everyone's really confident that they know how toilets work. But if you ask them for details, they discover really quickly that um, they don't actually know. <laughs> like, so the water drops out of the tank. And then how does it, then how does it like suction the water out of the bowl? Right, right. And so on. So if you just ask like, how do you know, or how does that work? Or can you explain that to me? Um, people are much more willing to hear new explanations or hear new views. Um, and so you can do that, not just with respect to toilets or politics. You can, you can do that with respect to anything. Mm. And that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of what we're doing in philosophy. We, we often are just examining each other's reasons. So we can kind of hold our conclusions at arm's length and say, like, today we're talking about whether free will exists. What sort of reasons can you give one way or the other? And then we just evaluate whether those are good or bad reasons. Right. Um, and I think that's a useful skill. I, I and, agree. Yeah, being yeah. able to hold ideas at, like, a distance of realizing, like, not all di ideas have to be intrinsic to your identity. Um, you can yeah. hold them out here and evaluate them. Yeah, and I guess what I've been, I don't know, it's been sort of discouraging the last few weeks. Um, so I've been on Twitter for a while now, but I don't know, the last few weeks I've just seen, kind of ventured into like sex and gender conversations on Twitter and I've just seen people uh -oh. get really angry, mm -hmm. but also just demonstrate a total inability to even like understand what an argument is or like what would count as an objection. Or So, so many people will like respond to an argument by saying something really loudly with like, insults and curse words but what they're saying is like totally consistent with the argument like it's yeah just, and like I mean, strong like, language strong moralizing language yeah 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 they're just sort of i guess what they're doing all that they've learned is thinking by association like what critical thinking is is i hear what you said and then i kind of do some free association in my own mind <laughs> and, and then i report my feelings back to you um, yeah. So what you said made me think about this and, oh man, I just really don't like that. And I'm going to tell you about it. And so unfortunately, <laughs> I think because we're not teaching people philosophy or logic, we end up just interacting with each other and disagreeing with each other in this way that's just kind of free association and sharing our feelings and emoting to each other. Yeah, that's and actually, never I've never thought of it in that way, actually. But I think you're like really onto something there of like, of like why specific because i've been i haven't had the language for why critical thinking education didn't work because i got it and i knew it was garbage and then i got a tiny bit of training in logic and i was like this is way better like this is literally so much more helpful all of my papers improved uh all of my argumentation improved all of my thinking improved um and i think you actually hit the nail on the head which is like when we are talking critical thinking to kids what we're teaching them is to hear an argument and they go no but I feel and think this way and the kind of post hoc rationalize a bunch of reasons why you feel like you disagree and then spit those out on a paper and feel really confident about it. And I think like in many ways, we've like just taught a lot of people to be really confident about like basically like unironically, like just kind of post hoc rationalizations for like this is like this feels mostly right because it, it feels right, which is like I, I'm in psychology. I'm all for the feelsies uh, and I don't think feelings are devoid of things like logic and rationality. I think that they always go together. Um, but that's a really interesting way of analyzing it. I haven't really, th I've always seen it as like a no but, where people are like, no but, and it's like, <laughs> chill, why don't we try yes and? Like, yeah, that's true. But, and, have you thought about this, right? Um, yeah, that's a yeah, really I, interesting I approach. I'm experiencing, I'm experiencing a lot of the no but on Twitter, and it's like, ugh, That is Twitter. 
Yeah. Um, so I guess I would just say, if I would just really quickly want to encourage your audience to study at least some philosophy if they can formally in a university, if that's possible, but even if that's not possible, um, just pick up a book and I, I, I'd be happy to recommend some books. Mm -hmm. Cause, um, I remember when I was in grad school, the job market is not great for philosophy. And so it's always a very live possibility that all these years of effort <laughs> for the PhD are going to amount to nothing and you're not going to end up working in philosophy. Um, and so what I tell students who are interested in going to grad school is I, I tell them this, um, just imagine that you're not going to get a job at the end of it in philosophy. Um, would it still be worthwhile to you? Would you still value the experience? And if yes, then for sure, go and go and do it. And that's how I felt about my own education in philosophy. Um, even if I had not gotten a job, that time would not have been wasted um, because it just makes it's it's a kind of, as I think I said earlier, like mental hygiene or mental fitness that changes the way you look at everything and improves your ability to gather and assess information and just uh, I'm worried that this is like this this word has been painted by Scientology, but it, it makes you sort of a clear thinker, you know, it gives you a kind of clarity um, that is priceless. Um, so that's I think that's what we should be trying to convey to kids. Um, and unfortunately, it sounds like the kind of critical thinking education you're describing is is not doing that. Right. Yeah. All right. I have a I have a spicier question for you. So a lot of so I usually not people who pursue philosophy with master's levels, at least I don't come across this. But there's a lot of people I know who get a bachelor's in either major or minor in philosophy. And I call it like philosophy student syndrome, where they are sometimes the most obnoxious people to try to talk to about ideas, which is su surprising because it feels like antithet it feels like it's like of all the people that should be good to talk about ideas with, you'd think somebody trained in philosophy would would be the best person, but they also get very pedantic and they'll just like cite old names being like, when you're using this word, are you using like this original author meant? And it's like, no, I'm just like using it the way like everyone mostly uses it, like broadband cultural thing, where they get like very, very pedantic and rigid. And um, it feels like they like, they get trained so much in everything that they like lose the plot almost. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's something that you're familiar with. It's, I think it's always good to be aware of the biases that your own field can create in your own thinking and stuff. In psychology, mm -hmm. we see everything as mental health, obviously. Yeah. No, um, I'm definitely familiar with that. And, um, you know, in the field, we say things like a little philosophy is a dangerous thing. That's what we say. A little bit of philosophy is a dangerous thing. Um, and I think even in my own case, that was true. Like when I was new to philosophy and just doing it a little bit, I think I was that, uh, I was very obnoxious. I was that obnoxious. <laughs> um, just really stubborn and dogmatic and yeah, like aggressive. Religious. They're um, like religious about their philosophy. It's very strange. I'm like, yeah, and I think like part of it, at least in my case, and probably for a lot of other people, is a kind of insecurity. Because when I was new to philosophy, I was really worried that like just around the next corner, I was going to find a devastating objection to all the beliefs that I cherished. <laughs> and I knew that like all these people are like way better at philosophy than me. And if I talked to that person, um, they would they would crush my beliefs. And so there's a lot of like insecurity um, that manifests itself at least in me and maybe in other people as a kind of stubborn autism. Um, and so I think two things happen, at least in my own life, a lot of other philosophers is, um, especially in my PhD program, um, it is the kind of PhD program I went to was sort of old school where it was sort of a dog eat dog situation and it was a zero sum game. And there were literally like, if you perform well, you get a fellowship. And if you don't, you might be asked oh to leave. Gosh. So it's not like we could have all gotten the fellowship. Um, yeah, there were there were high stakes and limited resources. And, um, and a lot of, I'll just be honest, like, a lot of like British philosophers, a lot of UK academics who have a, who have a very like confrontational style. Um, and so <laughs> it was really humbling and intense. Um, and some people didn't make it. A lot of people dropped out. There was a very high attrition rate. Yep. Um, but if you survived, you came out the other side necessarily with like humility, just like epistemic humility. Like yeah. I've, I've been wrong so many times. <laughs> um, I could be wrong right now. 
maybe what I just said was wrong. Um, and so it really humbles you. So that's one thing that happened to me. Um, yeah, and then I guess another thing that happened was, I think, uh, okay, this is, I just talked about epistemic humility, and I'm going to say something that might not sound so humble, but I, <laughs> I, I was able to develop a degree of competence in philosophy so that I no longer felt like so insecure and scared anymore. Like I, I no longer feel like just around the corner is a devastating objection. I've kind of seen around every corner. Um, yeah. And yeah, I don't want to like brag, but I feel like I have a degree of competence in philosophy. So that mellowed me out too. Like I don't feel so insecure anymore. I kind of feel like I have accomplished some things. Um, it's pretty clear that I'm at least competent at philosophy. Um, so I think that mellowed me a lot, mellowed me out a lot too. Um, so unfortunately that doesn't always happen with people who just take a few courses in philosophy or get just a bachelor's in philosophy. They might miss out on that sort of very intense kind of humbling experience. Um, and they may not develop a degree of competency so that they no longer feel insecure. So maybe that's what's going on. And that's why a little bit of philosophy is a dangerous thing. Interesting. Um, do you mind if I read you a couple of like super chats and questions that are sent in by the community? No mind. Okay. Uh, so if you guys want to send in questions um, to do you're known as Professor Aqua, is that what you want to be referred by or? Um, I mean, I guess if I were like trying to enter the space and develop a brand, maybe I'd go with that. Um, but no, I'll just use my name. I am, you can call me Thomas. Okay. So if you if guys you were, have. If you were like in my class, I guess you could call me professor, but. Okay. My, so. That's true. We're equals. All right. Uh, if you have questions for professor, not professor, yeah. just Thomas, <laughs> but also professor Thomas, uh, send it in through super chats is going to be the easiest way and bits highlights your message. So it's the easiest to see. I will try to pull questions from people who like don't want to send money, but obviously um, pays my bills and makes it easier to see as well. So I've got a question from Wolf, the Wolf of Gar, which says, do you, uh, do you think that kids should be taught how to formalize arguments into like modus ponens, tollens, etc., as part of critical thinking? And I guess you know what this is asking. Yeah. So, um, the question was, should kids be taught to formalize arguments into modus ponens, modus tollens, et cetera? So I certainly do that with my own students, like the first week of every class. I what is a I modus do. ponens and tollens? Nobody knows um, what that means. Yeah, so, um, well, if, yeah, you said you may not remember much from your logic class, but no. you may remember if you did, if you constructed proofs in logic, um, every time you write a new line in the proof, you have to cite a justification. Like, where did this line come from? Was it an assumption or did I derive it from other things in the proof? Right. And these rules of derivation um, are, there's, there's some that are really common and some of them are so common they have names. And one of them is called modus ponens, which is just um, a Latin phrase meaning the mode or way of putting or affirming, like poner in Spanish. Um, and so it's just this argument form. If A, then B. So it's one of those conditionals we were talking about, if A, then B. And then if we also know that A is true, then we can conclude that B is true. A, then B, yeah. Yeah, if A, then B. And then we a, find out A is true. Yeah. Then so B. Then, oh, well, then I guess B follows. Okay. Yeah, so that's modus ponens. Um, so the question was, I guess, would it be useful to teach maybe smaller children these sorts of rules of inference? Um... Yeah, I don't know. I've never tried. I really want to try with my daughter um, and see how much uptake there is. And yeah, I don't know. maybe they would be daunted by the Latin, but I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't underestimate them. I would certainly want to teach kids um, very common rules of inference, but maybe we could like make it fun and use colors and have cutesy names or something for the little kids. But I think it is important that they start thinking um, about arguments in terms of common forms. Um, because just a common mistake that I see in my own students is if I ask them um, to like lay out an argument or, you know, what is your argument for this conclusion? What I end up getting is just a numbered list of sentences. And it's not really clear how these sentences relate to each other, um, how they're supposed to get you the conclusion. Mm -hmm. Some of the sentences on this list seem totally unnecessary. Um, so there's a lot of like, 
you know, um, superfluous information on the list. But if you study logic and study these argument forms, you'll start seeing patterns and realizing like, well, here's, here are the premises I actually need to get this conclusion. Uh, I'm trying to prove that B is true. Mm -hmm. Maybe one way I could do it is show that A entails B and that A is true. Oh, that's one way to do it. Um, there, I just use modus potens. Um, so yeah, at least with my own students, I certainly teach them those things. And um, I guess I was also gonna mention briefly, it, it came up earlier in the conversation, but my university is currently revising their general education curriculum. And it looks like there's only a few courses that will be required of every student. And one of them is gonna be devoted to thinking well. Um, so this sort of, to, to logic and argument. And so that's really cool. Philosophers have been asked to play a kind of formative role in developing the course. And yeah, what we're trying to do with that course for all the incoming college students is teach them how to construct arguments and evaluate arguments. Mm. Uh, yeah, Femi Void 200 asked a really interesting question. Why is philosophy so male dominated, but many of the other humanities are the opposite? Why is philosophy so male dominated? Yeah, that's something that um, philosophers have wondered about. Um, I guess maybe a psychologist would be better positioned to answer this question. <laughs> um, because, I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you some theories that have been proposed. Um, so one theory is, um, as a matter of historical fact, a lot of the most famous philosophers throughout history were male. And so if a syllabus is stacked with male authors, um, this may send a message, like unintentionally, that this field is not for you unless you're male or something like that. So um, a lot of philosophers are intentional about, um, you know, diversifying, diversifying their syllabi um, so that you don't unintentionally send that message. Mm. Um, something I, yeah, I don't know. This isn't as effective, but when I, if I, when I'm designing, when I'm designing a syllabus, I try to just use last names so that you just can't even maybe tell, like um whether the author was male or female um another another theory that has been proposed is um because it was historically male dominated here's something that might have happened if people naturally vary with respect to their judgments about common thought experiments in philosophy um so that if there's even a slight tendency for males to have one kind of response to common thought experiments and females to have another kind of common response. But as a matter of historical fact, the instructors were typically male. And then the instructor tells you, well, obviously, here's the right response or something like that. And it's the it's the response that's more typical of males. Then again, that might send a message to the females that this isn't for you or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's another theory. Um, I guess some philosophers are just willing to say they don't know why it's so male dominated. Um, another explanation I've heard proposed is this may just be a similar kind of explanation as to why, I don't know, whatever's happening with like engineering and mathematics and physics, those, my understanding is those are also male dominated. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Maybe whatever explains what's happening in those fields would also explain what's happening in philosophy. Um, and then some people just say, we, we don't really know what that is. Um, could be natural divergence in interests, um, or maybe not natural, could be a result of socialization. I'll, I'll just say one thing, this is a little less uh, controversial or explosive, but um, for sure, in my own experience, um, there are far fewer religious people in philosophy than non-religious people. Um, it's like way out of proportion to the general population. Hmm. Um, so like in the general population, most people believe in God, but in philosophy, most people don't. And very few, like it's some, somewhere around 20% of philosophers say they believe in God. In the general population, it's way higher. So why is that? Um, you might have thought, well, it's because when you study philosophy, you learn how stupid religion is. <laughs> I think um, it's about so, being academics, right? Like just, I would be curious if philosophy has, I would be suspicious if philosophy is a higher percentage of religious yeah. people compared to other fields in like STEM or psychology, the humanities. I don't know the d data, but I'd be curious about that. Well, I think, yeah, we'd have to look at the numbers, but we could, I think, would we agree that probably in theology, there are more theists. Than For sure. Theists. Yeah. They're probably going to seminary um, and stuff. So yeah, it could be a selection of, or it could be a treatment effect. Like what happens is you take philosophy, you hear all these objections and you realize 
Um, wow, how stupid it is to believe in God. And so people come in religious, but leave non-religious. But um, there's, a, there's a survey of philosophers that's being conducted kind of regularly. It's on um, Phil Papers is the website, like philosophy papers, but Phil Papers. They do something called the Phil Survey. And you can see um, the breakdown in these sorts of views. Um, and you can slice the information in interesting ways. So you can, you can see among undergraduates, how many of them are theists? Among graduate students, how many of them? Among professional philosophers, how many of them? And what's interesting is you don't see this. You don't see a lot of undergraduates who believe in God and then fewer graduate students and then fewer faculty. Right. It's just a lot of atheists the whole time. <laughs> And so maybe what's happening is it's more like a selection effect. And it may well be that, and I don't want to like blame philosophy professors, although maybe there are some who just make it a hostile environment for religious people. That, mm. In fact, I know there are some like that. Let's just be honest. Right. Um, there are some like that. And so some religious people get the idea, this is not for me. This is not, this is not a field that welcomes people like me. Right. Um, but also, I think some of the blame should be placed on religious communities mm -hmm. who teach their young people that like um, reason is scary and philosophy is dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I think Martin Luther actually said like reason is a whore and is like un unfaithful, unreliable, will betray you and so on. Um, and so if you're taught that from a very young age, then you won't even enroll in a philosophy class. You'll just right. have been trained from a young age to think that's not for me. In fact, that's dangerous. <laughs> so um, again, there might be explanations like that when it comes to religious belief. And I don't know, maybe maybe some kind of socialization would explain the the gender disparity in philosophy as well. Yeah, I mean, you're kicking open a whole bunch of topics that I'm really interested in because I actually come from a religious background. I'm so religious myself as well. Um, obviously, I'm not in the domain of philosophy. I was actually really lucky. Almost all my philosophy profs and in fact, I probably got the most hostility from my like strictly like sociology humanities profs. Um, all my philosopher profs, a lot of them were ex-pastors actually. So they weren't Christians themselves anymore, but they weren't like super hostile. They weren't like anti theists, which was very nice. Um, all my biology profs were great. Um, most of my psychology profs were also excellent about it. And then most of my sociology profs were awful, 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 awful about it, which was a very weird experience because I was expecting that philosophy and especially like my evolutionary biology professor, I expected to for sure be the worst. And he was probably the best about it of all of my professors, which was really interesting. Um, I'd be curious what you think with the, the female male divide in very much we see, especially in like very early developmental stuff, we see boys tend to be oriented towards things and girls towards um, people. Um, and boys seem to be a lot more rigid in that. So girls, like young little girls, you can tend to get them interested in people and things um, with enough like nurturing. Whereas if you do the same with boys, for the most part, even if you try to get them interested in people, they're like, nah, I just want my trucks. Like, I just want things, 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 things. Um, men are a lot more rigid, it seems, in their preoccupation with things. Whereas women are seem to be a little bit more like fluid and flexible about like what they can kind of be nurtured into being interested in. Um, so I'd be curious if that's part of it, is that philosophy is very much about things ideas, I right? ideas are things, whereas other humanities seem to dominantly be about people, right? Sociology and psychology and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, on that sort of question, I would, as I said, defer to the psychologist, but I have heard that sort of thing before. Um, it's unclear to me whether this discrepancy in interests is um, like to what degree it's nature and to what degree it's nurture. And yeah. as you said, you can kind of socialize females out of it to some degree. Um, but yeah, if something like that is going on, then philosophy is, I don't know, it's super abstract, at least like, if you look in like philosophy of logic and just super abstract metaphysics, um, those I think are probably the most male dominated parts mm -hmm. of philosophy. Whereas if you start looking into, um, philosophy of language and, um, and I think linguistics as well, that's outside of philosophy, but philosophy of language and the various subdisciplines within ethics you find much less male domination so again i'm not saying this is due to like innate interests um, it could be totally socialization but that uh, seems to confirm this sort of hypothesis that um whether through nature or nurture males are attracted to a certain kind of inquiry and females another 
Um, but I, I guess I'll just quickly add that um, philosophers have been trying to remedy this situation for many years, and it seems like um, their progress has been made, I should say. Mm -hmm. It went from like below 20% of professional philosophers were female to now I think it might be in the mid twenties or <laughs> maybe 30. Yeah. It's, it's so like modest gains, but yeah. um, a difference has been made. Um, all right. We got another question from Froggy Style. <laughs> Any books or readings you would recommend for non-academics to understand logic and philosophy on a basic level? My chat loves book recommendations and they often do take them. So we take it seriously here. Yeah. So logic and philosophy. <clears throat> um, you know, just a nice like um, essay length or article length um, introduction to critical thinking. Is, and you can find it if you just Google, I think. A friend of mine named E.J. Kaufman, um, he's at uh, the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. I'm guessing K-A-U-F? Um, C-O-F-F-M-A-N, I think. E.J. Kaufman. Okay. Um, he wrote an article called Finding, Clarifying, and Evaluating Arguments finding, mm -hmm. clarifying, and evaluating arguments. And I love that title because that's basically, as I said, that's like my job and that's what I do for a living. And that's all that I really teach the students. But I give them a lot of content about, you know, philosophical content, but the method that we're using is always just every day, let's find an argument. Let's um, lay it out step by step. We're gonna clarify it. How does it work? What are all the parts? And then we're gonna evaluate it. We're gonna raise objections to premises. Um, so that's all we do all day, every day, finding, clarifying, and evaluating arguments. So I have all of my classes every time, every semester, the first reading assignment is that, um, because often I have students with no background in philosophy. Um, a book that you might be interested in is if you, if you just wanted like a nice intro to philosophy is, um, there, a f uh, I guess it might be over 10 years ago now, but um, Ted Sider, Ted Sider and Earl Connie, which I think is spelled C-O-N-E-E, -E, wrote a book called Riddles of Existence, mm -hmm. which is just a nice thin little book that gives you a tour of some interesting issues in metaphysics about like the relationship of the mind and the body, the nature of time, um, whether we have free will and so on. And they do a pretty good job of presenting arguments. It's all like argument based, looking at arguments on both sides. Mm -hmm. And Ted Sider and Earl Connie are both top-notch philosophers, so that's a good recommendation. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if you wanted a, a, a like an actual textbook for logic. You know, there are actually some free some free textbooks online, and actually websites where you can practice doing proofs. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd have to search for those to get you the URL. If you send me the links, I'll attach them in the description of this video once we edit it so that people can click it. Yeah, I have a whole folder in my Dropbox of textbooks. <laughs> um, so I could just send you links to those and maybe I'll just pick one that I think would be best for somebody who's genuinely new to philosophy. Um, if you wanted to learn like formal symbolic logic, I could, I could include a link to that. Um, yeah. I guess that's all that comes to mind. But I remember after the Destiny stream, somebody on Reddit compiled, like somebody private messaged me on Twitter and then compiled a list of reading recommendations. And so it's somewhere on Reddit in like Destiny's Reddit. <laughs> oh, person. okay. That's a deep hole. But... Yeah, so, well, if you just, I think if you just search for my name, there's only so many things that come up. If you just okay. search for my last name, you might be able to find a long list of reading suggestions. Okay, okay. Um, okay, uh, one last question uh, that's been sent in by Elias Rain. I'm curious to your view, or what your view is on objective morality, given that you're a supernaturalist. Okay, so I take it the question. Um, so um, unfortunately, I think words like objective and subjective have been used in many different ways by many different people. So I myself tend to try to rephrase the question to not use those words. Um, that's something I recommend to my students as well. Mm -hmm. So what I think is probably being asked is, do you think that there are moral truths that were not made true by us, that were 
true independent of our minds. So yeah, um, some people, like I said, moral relativists will say that there are moral truths, but they're made true by conventions adopted by cultures. So they're made true by us, by our minds. Mm -hmm. Moral realists will say there are moral truths um, that are made true not by any conventions that we've adopted. There are just these like facts that are part of the fabric of the universe about what's good and bad, right and wrong. Just like how there are mind independent truths about mathematics and about logic. Um, so at least my view about mathematics is two plus two is four and not because of any conventions we've adopted. Of course, we adopted conventions with symbols, mm -hmm. but what the symbols represent was not made true by us. Right. Um, okay, so the question is, is that how morality is? Is it more like mathematics or is it more like truth in a fiction? The way that Harry Potter is a wizard is true according to the fiction that J.K. Rowling came up with. And um, euthanasia is okay according to the moral fiction that this culture tells itself. Right. Um, I, I think it's, I think, no surprise, um, moral facts are mind independent. I am a moral realist. Um, so if that's what the questioner meant by objective morality, yeah, sign me up. I definitely think there are mind independent moral truths um, that were not made true by conventions that we adopt. And just a quick way to see this, I think, is reflect on how cultures can get morality wrong. Um, and many cultures have gotten morality wrong. Um, and that's not just a mere matter of opinion, but they were, in fact, mistaken when they enslaved people or engaged in human sacrifice or um, sexism and racism ran rampant. Um, these were all moral errors mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so yeah that's i guess i guess the shorter answer would just be yes <laughs> should have just said yes <laughs> <laughs> that was very philosopher of you to do the long the long wandering answer for essentially yes um okay i'm just gonna check my chat make sure that i haven't missed anything ah no i did miss one okay missed a couple hold on regarding creative anti-realism this is from goblin lord x I don't know why they didn't load up on my thing. Sorry about that. Wouldn't what you described mean all statements are both true and false? At that point, does the term truth actually just convey anything meaningful? Okay, so the question was, with regard to creative anti-realism, wouldn't that mean or entail that all statements are true and false? Yes, and at what point does truth actually convey anything meaningful? Oh, um, so yeah, on that view of the world... Yeah, I think the questioner might be getting at something pretty important. Um, so on that view of the world, truth exists. They'll say, yeah, there is such a thing as truth. But truth is not a matter of correspondence to the world. So hopefully you, a lot of your viewers have this sort of view. I think this is kind of the common sense view of what truth is. Um, and this is what Aristotle said. To say of what is, that it is, is true. And of what is not, that it is not, that's true. So when you say something and it matches the world, that's truth. Um, so that's a correspondence theory of truth. But that requires that like reality have a kind of texture that could match my sentences. Right. So that when I say um, this water bottle is made of metal or something like that, there would have to be this fact in the world that makes the sentence true. And these creative anti-realists tend to think there are no facts out there in the world. Um, as Rorty said again, the world doesn't divide itself into sentence-shaped chunks called facts. So truth is not a matter of correspondence. Okay, um, so what is truth on these views? Um, when something's true, it's true by convention. Um, and so the way that Richard Rorty put it, and I think I mentioned this elsewhere on YouTube, is um, on Richard Rorty's view, this was a pragmatic theory of truth. Um, he said, truth is what my peers will let me get away with saying. Truth is what my peers will let me get away with saying. So truth is the sort of thing that you could like utter in a society and not be punished or contradicted or something like that. That's what truth is. Mm -hmm. Falsehood is um, the sort of things you would utter that would be contradicted or punished or something like that. That's what falsehood is. That's what falsehood is. So truth is something that like is useful, that lets you navigate through society. Falsehood is stuff that makes your life difficult when you say it. That's a, that was a, that's a kind of pragmatic theory of truth. And so on that theory, um, 
there may well be two cultures where um, what look to be contradictory sentences are both true. So I don't know, I guess we have to think of an example. Um, I guess we could just use moral examples. Let's see. What are some differences in moral opinion that exist currently in different parts of the world? Is it... Uh, I was going to use, like, women should be allowed to drive. Is that still illegal in Saudi Arabia? I think they are now allowed to drive, technically. Allowed to drive. Okay. Yeah, you lost that one. Uh, but what's another... Female mutilation is good versus female, female mutilation is bad. Mutilation? Mm -hmm. okay. Circumcision. I should say circumcision because that would be what the pro side would call it. Okay, circumcision. Um, so, yes, yeah, in some cultures, uttering that sentence will get you like punished, contradicted, hassled, and so on. Um, circumcision is wrong. Let's say that's a sentence. In some cultures, that'll get you hassled. In other cultures, everything will run smoothly if you say that. Your peers will let you get away with saying that. And so on this kind of pragmatic theory of truth, where truth is just a matter of convention, in this culture, it's true that circum... Or sorry, this was the one that would hassle you if you said it. In this culture, it's, it's false that circumcision is wrong. In this culture, it's true that circumcision is wrong. Hmm. Um, and yeah, that, that could happen on this kind of pragmatic relativistic theory of truth. Yeah. And again, if you ask them, if you ask Richard Rorty or this kind of creative anti-realist, well, what's the fact of the matter? Is it really right or wrong? Um, they would say you've misunderstood the nature of reality. Okay. <laughs> You're asking me to peel back our conventions and see what's really down there, and there's nothing down there beyond our conventions. And I can tell, based on how you describe it, that it is not a moral, metaphysical belief that you find overly compelling. No. Hence your um, supernaturalist. Yeah, no, I don't like that. I don't think that view is true at all. Um, and in fact, I think it's sort of pernicious. If we're just being honest, I think it's dangerous. <laughs> mm. I think it has had really negative influences and uh, consequences throughout history. Then you're going to love Moses, Malo Moses Molossus' question, because it's right on theme with that, actually. Uh, is the problem with postmodernism or, um, sorry, creative anti-realism that bad faith, less intelligent people uh, can use it to come to any conclusion? What are your gripes with it if it's not that? And part two to that is asking because it seems that the least dogmatic, le uh, it seems the least dogmatic leading to more questions being asked, thus having more potential uh, in the right hands. Does that make sense to you? I'm trying to, it's not a fully grammatical sentence, but. Um, can you read the last sentence again? Yeah, I didn't really get that. Asking because it seems the least dogmatic leading to more questions being asked, thus having more potential in the right hands. I think they're saying, asking because it seems like, for example, the least dogmatic person probably is going to ask more questions and probably is not likely to maybe rise to the top of the thinking hierarchy and thus have more potential for like in postmodernism where there's less questions being asked, I think is kind of the implication, might fall into the wrong hands. Maybe we can deal with the first part at least. Is post is the problem with postmodernism that bad faith, less intelligent people can use it to come to any conclusions? And if that's not your problems with it, what are your gripes with it? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, just one meta remark really quick. It seemed like um, the question was, how, let's evaluate creative anti-realism. What do we think about it? Should we adopt it or not? And the sort of reasons given in favor and against it were sort of practical reasons, like what sort of consequences would it have? If we adopted it, would it allow bad faith, less intelligent people to run amok or do something harmful. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if it were true, um, wouldn't that reduce dogmatism and have all sorts of positive consequences? So my meta remark is, I think if you're trying to figure out which of these views to adopt, um, I think the primary question you should ask is, which one is true? <laughs> Not what kind of consequences would, would these have? And so I know a moment ago I did mention that I think creative anti-realism has had negative consequences. But the reason I reject it primarily is I think it's false. Um, I don't think that's really the way the world is. Um, and so if you ask me, well, why do you think it's false? I guess one thing that comes to mind is just, um, I guess I'll just briefly mention that if you actually ask for arguments or what, what reasons people can give in its favor, the arguments are not very good. Um, but if you ask me for a positive reason to think it's false, I would just say it seems to have some really implausible implications. And one of them we just looked at with regard to morality it sure looks like the view entails that there are no moral facts of the matter. So, you know, the, the Nazis had their morality, we have our morality, and that's the end of the story. 
So I don't think that is the end of the story. I think the end of the story is that the Nazis were wrong, like terribly wrong. Um, they were incorrect um, in their moral views. Um, so the fact that creative anti-realism entails that, you know, at the end of the day, there really are no moral facts, um, I find that incredibly hard to believe. And I would just ask, like, why, why, why should I believe what seems to me self-evidently false? Yeah. So doesn't, it, doesn't it seem that, like, treating people differently just on the basis of their race, that's terrible. Um, discriminating against people on the basis of their sex, that's awful. Not to mention genocide and slavery. These things are all genuinely bad, um, irrespective of our opinions about it. And some people have been wrong. Right. Um, so, yeah, the view entails that that's not the case. And I guess um, and it also, I mean, it just entails this about truth generally. If you, It entails this about um, physical truths and um, historical truths and mathematical truths. All of these things are just true by convention. So I would have thought two plus two really is four. And that's not just a result of our conventions. I understand you can adopt a different system of mathematics with like different false axioms where that sentence comes out as true. Um, but now let's talk reality. In reality, two plus two is four, um, and it must be. Okay, mm -hmm. um, I was gonna say one other thing. Uh, oh yeah, I was gonna say that, again, just going back to that Vosh debate, um, the reason I brought up like a truth of chemistry, water is H2O, was because I think there, when we're talking about physics and chemistry and we're really down at like the bottom level of reality, yeah. creative anti-realism starts looking pretty implausible, pretty hard to believe. Yeah. Because you end up saying things like, it hasn't always been true that water is H2O. And um, before humans, it, was, it wasn't true that dinosaurs existed. So yeah, these are all sorts of implications that I find totally um, unbelievable. Okay. Um, Isaac T3 asked, what do you think of the idea that gender identity has a neurological basis as a type of male, female phenotype? Um, I'm gonna guess, and then they said, and uh, gender identity dysphoria being similar to, they said gynecomastia, but that's extra breast tissue on men. I think they're meaning autogynephilia. Okay, I heard the first part of the question, which was, what do you think about gender identity having a neurological basis? What was the second part of the question? I believe it is GID, gender dysphoria, being similar to uh, autogynephilia. autogynephilia. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think those are a little bit clinical, but if you'd like yeah. to give a stab at them. Um, yeah, I, th I think I might have to punt on the second one, because I think that is a question for, like, psychologists. But the first one was, um, what do you think about gender identity having a neurological basis? Well, I'm of a mind that um, probably all of our mental states and all of our mental phenomena have some neurological basis. Like there's something going on in my brain when I move my hand. There's something going on in my brain when I think about math. Um, so I myself am a dualist about the mind and the brain. Mm -hmm. But I still think there's um, these correlations between mental right. states and brain states. Okay, so if the question was just with respect to if two people have different gender identities, will there be some neurological difference? Well, insofar as this is a mental difference, yeah, I think there's probably going to be a neurological difference. Right. Um, similar. Uh, that's just that's just follows from a general principle. Like if you and I have different beliefs about the weather, what the weather is like right now, there's going to be some neurological difference going on in us. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would think there would there would have to be some neurological difference if there was a mental difference. <laughs> oh yeah. Although, oh, just yeah, you probably don't want to hear this, and this is like for academics. But there there are some wrinkles here with respect to the content of my utterances, and sometimes the content of my utterances may be determined by things outside of my skull. So that was just a footnote that probably shouldn't have been said. But um, with respect to gender identity, how I feel about my own, um, my own gender and my own sex, I would say there is a neurological basis there. Uh, the second one was, is dysphoria similar to autogynephilia? Yeah, I'm, I think that's a question for psychologists. And I, I, guess, I, would, I guess I'd have to get really clear on what, we're, what we mean by similar, similar in what way. Um, so I hope you don't mind if I just totally punt on that question. Yeah, I think it's totally valid to say. That's not in my scope, not my purview. 
there's nothing better in my mind than people being like, I don't know, it's not, it's not within my wheelhouse, I'm not sure. I wish more people would say, I don't know. I've, I've really taken an art of trying to say, I don't know when I don't know the answer to something. It's probably a better place to be. Um, okay, I think that's everything that's come in money-wise. I don't want to like ignore somebody if they sent money. That would be crappy of me. Yes. I think okay. we could probably do one more. I'm going to have to leave just a little bit before four. Yeah. Right. Yeah, uh, there's no more questions sent in. Um, I have a lot of questions for you about like religion, but maybe I can book you again for another chat because I have like a whole, once you started men mentioning supernaturalism and stuff, somebody posed me a question about like the Trinity recently that like I haven't fully wrestled through and I'd be super curious just to kind of hear your thoughts on it as well. Okay. Can um, do you feel comfortable telling me anything at all, a little more about your religious background? Yeah, so I grew up fundamental Christian Pentecostal. Uh, I'm not a fundamentalist at all anymore. Um, kind of agree with the Catholics that it's a little bit heretical to be fundamentalist. Uh, but I'm still a Christian, although I kind of say I'm the Christian that most Christians don't own because I'm, yeah, I just like to engage with theology really deeply and richly. And a lot of fundamentalists really don't like that when you're like, yeah, but Samson, what didn't like really do? what they said in the story because that's not really the point of it like it's not about like literally happening it's about like the meaning that you're viewing from the story like it doesn't matter if you tied foxtails together that's not really the important part of the story anyways but lots of fundies right. don't like yeah, that we could talk about that sometime in the future i was um raised in a very traditional sort of protestant home i don't know depending on what you mean by fundamentalist i guess it might have been fundamentalist um very traditional devout lutherans um, but then I did convert to Catholicism later on in my life mm. when I was about 30 years old. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So I'll probably have lots of questions for you. Thanks. Uh, yeah. I've just, I love reading and like learning about theology and stuff. Um, I don't as much like debating on it. It makes me very angry, but yeah. All right. Well, okay. thanks for having me on. It was nice talking with you. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you.